Well, today we're going to do another show of Sovereign or Slave, and um, today I'm going to talk about the Constitution, once again, my favorite subject. One of them, anyway, sovereignty, common law. Anyway, here's the U.S. Constitution. You know, you can get these for free on the Internet, and, you know, or at least to read or to print, and you can go to Barnes & Noble, and for a couple dollars you can buy one. You can go to your state assembly person's office, and here in California, they'll give you this book, which is, you know, look how thick it is. It's got everything in it. Everything but a clear explanation of your rights. Okay, but anyway, so let's start off with the Constitution. Let's put it up here. We have the U.S. Constitution, and we go to, this is the preamble, right? So, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, well, actually, that's a lie, because those few people that created this Constitution made a pact with each other that nobody would reveal who they were or any of the evidence surrounding the Constitution until the last one was dead. Thank you, Mark Stevens, <clears throat> for bringing that to my attention. Uh, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves. <clears throat> to everybody? Or just to the people that signed this? Are we talking about a specific group? And to our posterity. That would be our kids. Do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. That language right there is the language of a trust, okay? So they've created a trust. Who's the grantors? We the people. What's well, unnamed, of course, but, you know. So we the people are the grantors. The uh, beneficiaries are our posterity, ourselves and our posterity. And who's the trustee, the one who's going to carry it out? Well, that would be the government officials who, through their oath of office, become trustees. But we're going to go straight to the stuff that I like. This is uh, powers granted to Congress under Section 8, right? Number 5. To coin money, regulate the value thereof of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. Okay? Coin money. So the federal government has the right to coin money. Does anybody else have the right to do that? Okay? Anybody else? Number six says to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. So Congress didn't have the right to do that because it says powers granted to Congress. Pow if Congress doesn't coin the money, nobody else can. Okay, this is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution under powers granted to Congress to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square. In other words, if the legislature purchases Alaska and it owns Alaska, it's the common law right to control your property, right? So here it is telling you that Congress can pass whatever legislation it wants, but it only applies to Washington, D.C., the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. It doesn't apply to the states. So if they pass a seatbelt law, that doesn't apply to the states. Generally speaking, within any state of this union, the preservation of the peace and protection of person and property are the functions of the state government and are no part of the primary duty, at least of the nation. Their job is to defend the country against foreign invaders. The laws of Congress in respect to those matters do not extend into the territorial limits of the states, but have force and effect only in the District of Columbia and other places that are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the national government. Now let's read that again. The laws of Congress. Hey, when the Congress passes a law in respect to any matter that has to do with the preservation of peace and the protection of person, person and property, which are the functions of state government, right, like making you wear a seat belt, have force only in the District of Columbia and other places that are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the national government. That would be other, the territories that are owned by the United States, the Virgin Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and that's from Caja versus United States, 152 U.S. 211 from 1894. 
a citizen of the District of Columbia cannot maintain an action, that's a lawsuit, in the circuit court of the United States, not being a citizen of a state within the meaning of the provision of the law of the United States, regulating the jurisdiction of the courts of the United States. Quote, it is true that as a citizen of the United States and of that particular district which is subject to the jurisdiction of Congress, once again, where does Congress have jurisdiction? Washington, D.C. only, and the other um, territories that are owned by the United States. It is extraordinary that the courts of the United States, which are open to aliens and to the citizens of every state in the Union, should be closed upon them, the residents of D.C. But this is a subject for legislative, not for judicial consideration. The opinion to be certified to the circuit court is that the court has no jurisdiction in the case. Hepburn and Dundas versus Elsie, 6 U.S. 2 445 from 1805. Another Supreme Court decision. One, this court is a constitutional as distinguished from a legislative court and can have no jurisdiction other than of cases and controversies falling within the classes enumerated in the judiciary article of the Constitution. It cannot give decisions which are merely advisory, nor can it exercise or participate in the exercise of functions which are essentially legislative or administrative. Two, a proceeding in the Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., under the Radio Act of 1927 to review an order of the Radio Commission refusing an application for the renewal of an existing license for full-time operation of a broadcasting station is not a case or controversy within the meaning of the Judiciary Article of the Constitution, but is an administrative proceeding. And, that, and the decision therein is not reviewable by the court. There they're telling you that if you apply for the privilege of having a license from, a re, from an administrative body, like the Department of Motor Vehicles is an administrative body, they hand out the privilege of driving and having a license. If you get a, a corporation, uh, a license to be a corporation, you're asking the state for a privilege. And the court, the Supreme Court here is stating that they have no right to interfere in the contract between you and an administrative agency. The problem is almost everything that gets passed today is an administrative agency. When you go to the uh, Board of Equalization and they have a franchise tax board, that's an administrative agency and they have they assume that you are you know, applying for the privilege of paying taxes. But it's not a tax enforced by the courts. That's why when you go to a hearing, you're not going to a court. You don't have the right to go to court. You only have the right to appear in their own little you know, star chamber where their rules are supreme. So you have to object to them having no authority over you and that you don't consent. The courts themselves in, in, uh, you know, today in California are administrative agencies, not within the, the um, jurisdiction of the state of California, and I'm going to prove it to you. Okay, this is a letter from Kamala Harris, the Attorney General of the State of California Department of Justice, Public Inquiries Unit, October 7th, 2011. In this letter, I filed a criminal complaint against a judge. You know, I filed charges against him for violating um, penal code, I think it was 182, maintaining a, a lawsuit under, uh, without merit anyway. And it's addressed to me, and you'll notice it's addressed care of the street address, which is really unusual. Man, they never do that stuff. And also, the name was in upper and lower case, which is really interesting because they never address you that way. Well, anyway, it says that while we appreciate the time and effort is taken to contact our office, we are unable to assist you because the Attorney General has no jurisdiction in matters already before the court or in matters where the courts have already rendered a decision. Well, they hadn't rendered a decision yet, and that wouldn't matter because 
if you're telling me that you don't have any jurisdiction to take criminal complaints or you didn't read the document to realize it was a criminal complaint, then you're just failing in your duty, right? So let's go down and see where it says, therefore we suggest that you consult with a private attorney. I am a private attorney. I'm not a public attorney. I don't have a bar card. I am a private attorney to determine any civil remedies, but they really like you to get an attorney. Why? Because as we discussed before, once you get an attorney, you have no rights whatsoever. The attorney is a, is a, a member of the court and can't challenge jurisdiction. So an attorney would directly represent your interests. That's a bold-faced lie. The attorney can't represent my interests. They have a sworn oath to only represent the interests of the court and the bankers who really run them. Your complaint about the judges involved in this case should be directed to the com Commission on Judicial Performance. Well, if they were intelligent at all, they would realize that the, the letterhead at the top of my complaint actually was addressed to Judith McConnell, care of the Judicial Performance in San Francisco. I was making a complaint to judicial, judicial Performance. I was just sending it to the Attorney General in addition and also to the presiding judge of the of the court that this judge was in. So there, what's really interesting about this letter is they actually tell you that the Judicial Performance Commission, which is not the state of California, it's a private group, a private corporation, has exclusive jurisdiction over complaints against judges. So you're telling me you can't file a criminal charge against a judge unless it goes through the judicial performance? I mean, these guys are in bed with each other. They're the same group. There's a conflict of interest there. The judicial performance, you know, is just another arm of the, of the you know, judges and the district attorney. So this is out of uh, The History of Common Law by Howard Fisher. In England, William Pitt summarized the concept of private property under common law as follows, quote, the poorest man may, in his cottage, bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storms may enter, the rains may enter, but the king of England cannot enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. And if this isn't the idea of the man's king at his castle, and you have common law rights to state no trespassing and nobody can enter unless you consent to it. This is, the, this is where it comes from, common law. And this is from 16 Am Jurisprudence 2nd, number 74. Construction with reference to common law. All important canon of construction is that constitutions must, or at least may, be construed with reference to the common law. Footnote 93, which goes down and lists all these cases. Although the reverse is not necessarily true, since in most respects the federal and state constitutions did not repudiate but cherished the established common law. So provisions of the federal constitution have been interpreted by reference to the common law in existence at the time of the writing of the document, because common law is what was in effect when the Constitution was written. That is the main law of the land. This is because the United States Constitution and the plan of government of the United States were founded on the common law as established in England at the time of the Revolution. Therefore, it is general rule that phrases in the Bill of Rights taken from the common law must be construed in reference to the latter. Powers forbidden to the state, section 10. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation. Grant letters of mark and reprisal. What's a letter of mark and reprisal? I mean, I don't think anybody understands these terms anymore. A letter of mark and reprisal. This is where the federal government would grant a privateer, somebody operating a ship for profit, the right to plunder Spanish ships. A letter, a letter of mark and reprisal. And yet the police use mark and reprisal to take your car. They take your car as prize under admiralty rules. Coin money emit credit. What's a bill of credit? How about, a, how about a bond, right? I mean, if you're going to emit a bond, float a bond, isn't that a bill of credit? 
make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. There's the big, huge one. You get rid of this one. You, t you take this one out of the equation and you've got the Federal Reserve passing funny money around like it has value. If you make this one essential, which they did in the Constitution, nothing but gold and silver coin, legal tender for payment of debts. Pass any bill of attainder. What's a bill of attainder? A bill of attainder is legislated crime. Bill of Attainder. Legislative acts, no matter what their form, that apply either to named individuals or to easily ascertainable members of a group in such a way as to inflict punishment on them without a judicial trial, are Bills of Attainder prohibited by the Constitution. Thus, the Bill of Attainder Clause not only was intended as one implementation of the general principle of fractionalized power, but also reflected the framers' belief that the legislative branch is not so well suited as politically independent judges and juries to the task of ruling upon the blameworthiness of and levying appropriate punishment upon specific persons. United States versus Brown, 381 U.S. 437, a Supreme Court case from 1965. The best available evidence, the writings of the architects of our constitutional system, indicate that the Bill of Attainder Clause was intended not as a narrow technical and therefore soon to be outmoded prohibition, but rather as an implementation of the separation of powers, a general safeguard against legislative exercise of the judicial function, or more simply, trial by legislature. The Bill of Pains and Penalties was identical to the Bill of Attainder, except that it prescribed a penalty short of death. In other words, the f any time they say that, you know, if you're going 20 miles an hour over the posted speed limit, you're guilty, that's a bill of attainder because they're saying that it's a crime to do a specific act and that and not that the judiciary doesn't determine whether it's a crime or not Congress determined it was a crime and you might think that's hard you know it's hard to understand this concept but <clears throat> under common law which was the law of the of the realm at the time you have to injure somebody in order to uh, bring them to court you have to injure somebody to be charged. And if you're charged, then you get brought to court. The individual may stand upon his constitutional rights as a citizen. He is entitled to carry on his private business in his own way. His power to contract is unlimited. He owes no such duty to the state and re since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. That's the purpose of the state. His rights are such as existed by the law of the land long antecedent to the organization of the state and can only be taken from him by due process of law and in accordance with the Constitution. Among his rights are a refusal to incriminate himself and the immunity of himself and his property from arrest or seizure except under a warrant of the law. He owes nothing to the public so long as he does not trespass upon their rights. You notice it doesn't say he owes anything to the state. He owes nothing to the public so long as he does not trespass upon their rights, the rights of the public. Hale versus Hinkle, 201 U.S. 43, at page 74 in 1905, and that's a Supreme Court decision. Is that the, the jury is the one who decides whether a crime has been determined, not the legislature. The legislature doesn't determine whether a crime has, been, has happened. The jury is the only one who looks at the facts and says, well, we're going to find this person guilty and charge and uh, sentence him. Jury rights nullification. The jury has the right to determine both the law and the facts. Samuel Chase, Supreme Court Justice from 1741 to 1811. It's not only his right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. So when the judge tells you what to do, no, nope, no juror has ever gone to prison for voting his conscience. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in Horning versus District of Columbia, 254 U.S. 135, a Supreme Court case in 1920, stated, the judge cannot direct a verdict, it is true, and the jury has the power to bring in a verdict in both in the teeth of both law and facts. In U.S. versus Doherty, 
Quote, the pages of history shine on instances of the jury's exercise of its prerogative to disregard the instructions of the judge. U.S. Supreme Court State of Georgia versus Brailsford, quote, it is presumed that the juries are the best judges of facts, and it is, on the other hand, presumed that the courts are the best judges of law. But still, both objects are within your scope of decision. You have the right to take upon yourselves to judge of both and to determine the law and as well as the facts in controversy. Circuit Court of Appeals, United States versus Moylan, quote, if the jury feels the law is unjust, we recognize the undisputed power of the jury to acquit, even if its verdict is contrary to the law and is given by a, as given by a judge and contrary to the evidence. If the jury feels the law under which the defendant is accused is unjust or the exigent circumstances justified the actions of the accused or for any reason which appeals to their logic or passion, the jury has the right to and pow, has the power to acquit and the courts must abide by that decision. In Maryland, by reason of the state constitution, the jury in a criminal case are, quote, the judges of law as well as the fact. Article 15, Section 5, and that's from Brady v. Maryland, 373, U.S. 83, in 1963, another Supreme Court decision. But if you have speeding tickets, then the legislature is finding you guilty. Not a jury, the legislature found you guilty. All they have to do is show the facts that you were doing, you know, you were doing what the what the uh, a bill of attainder says is wrong, and you're and you have to pay the fine. No jury has to determine it. You know, the jury can still nullify the traffic ticket, but the way the government has it set up today, it's basically a bill of attainder. It makes a specific group liable, right? That's what a bill of attainder is: is targeting a specific group, but in in this case, I'm going to say they target everybody who drives a car. That's the group. Okay, ex post facto law. No ex post facto law can be created by the state, and yet they do it all the time. Okay, this is right out of Black's Law. Fourth, ex post facto law. A law passed after the occurrence of a fact or commission of an act, which retrospectively changes the legal consequences or relations of such fact or deed. So you can't pass something after the fact. 700, a, a statement of financial uh, economic interest, the judges have to give it to you. Which, you know, because it would be a conflict of interest if they have stock in Capital One Bank and they're hearing a case where Capital One is a uh, party to the case. Fine's campaign to expose this judicial misconduct has led to his disbarment. Okay, in 2008, the landmark decision in Sturgeon versus County of Los Angeles made it clear that the supplementary payments to the judges were unlawful. This prompted the California Judicial Council to have a bill drafted that was quietly inserted into the state's budget legislation, SBX 211, and passed without public debate or awareness. This provision granted retroactive immunity from criminal prosecution to all the California judges and the county officials who either received or authorized illegal payments of public money. These de events demonstrate how the judiciary, with the help, with the power to silence its critics through imprisonment, can evolve into a corrupt enterprise, and it underscores the imperative to create an inspector general's office. Uh, Richard Fine in L.A. charged all the L.A. judges with committing crimes by taking bribes. And for, in, in, in response for $6,000 payments, the L.A. county judges were not ruling against the county. And so Fine charged them with that, and the legislature got together and passed a law that said retroactively, see, ex post facto, retroactively they're immune from prosecution for for committing the bribe, for taking bribes. Now, no state can pass an ex post facto law. They can't pass a law that's retroactive. They can't retroactively make something illegal or retroactively make something legal. 
or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any titles of nobility. Obligation of contracts. If I have a contract to represent you in court, right, I have a power of attorney to speak on your behalf and you grant me power of attorney, that's an obligation of contract. I have to perform. I've agreed to perform and speak as your attorney in fact. The courts go, you can't do that. So let's go on to Article 3, the judicial branch. Okay. Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution and the laws of the United States and the treaties made or of which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. So right there, the judicial power and that's, you know, the judicial power of the United States is different from the judicial power of the states. But there's only four forms of law mentioned. Uh, uh, common law, equity, admiralty, and maritime. Admiralty and maritime occur on the sea. Admiralty is, you know, basically war powers against other countries. Admiralty, a court which has a very extensive jurisdiction of maritime causes, civil and criminal controversies arising out of acts done upon or relating to the sea. So when they say that they have a right to take your car because you don't have tags and it's an in rem proceeding in admiralty, that would be a lie because it's, you're, you're, your car wasn't on the sea when it was taken. And questions of prize. Admiralty does not extend to all navigable waters, but is limited to the ocean, navigable rivers running into the ocean, and the Great Lakes and their connections. And that's from a court case, the Frank G. Fobert, DCNY 32F. And that's from Black's Law 4th in 1968. Equity is about trusts and contracts, well, mostly trusts, and common law is pretty much everything else, which is the majority of things. Article 6, relation of the states to each other. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings in every other state. Okay, so if there is a <coughs> judicial proceeding in Texas and I want to enter it into a California case, I guess they have to give full faith and credit. And they can't say, well, that happened in Texas. Section number two. The other thing it would be useful for is a notarization. If the notary is allowed to do something in Ohio, then the notary should be allowed to do something in California because it has to be equal everywhere. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Okay, so you can't have freedom in one state and be denied in another. Federal state relations, too. The Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Okay? Does that mean that they can have the power to dispose of or make needful rules and regulations regarding one of the several states? Does it say that? Does it say that Congress can pass laws that apply to you in Texas or Nevada? No, it doesn't. Only in property that's owned by the United States. Section 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. Right there. Republican government, one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people. So the government's not sovereign, the state's not sovereign, the people are sovereign and are exercised by the people either directly or through representatives chosen by the people to whom those powers are specifically delegated. I'm going to choose to exercise my sovereign powers directly. Thank you very much. What's that? I mean, it, there's, these have certain definitions. Does it say democracy anywhere? Nope. 
shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion on, upon application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. Article 6, National Debts, Supremacy of the National Government, 2. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, all treaties made of which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Wow, you'd think that they'd completely forgotten this. The judges in every state are bound by the Constitution, and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding, hey, if they're, con if they're in contrary to the Constitution, they don't stand up. They're void. If courts are to regard the Constitution and the Constitution is superior to any ordinary act of the legislature, the Constitution and not such ordinary act must govern the case to which they both apply. Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137, that's a Supreme Court case in 1803. Where rights are secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them abrogate would be to nullify them. Miranda versus uh, Miranda versus Arizona 384 US. A state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right guaranteed by the federal constitution. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania 319 US 105 in 1943 another Supreme Court decision. Quote, but the power of the state in that respect is not unlimited, and one of the limitations is that it may not impose conditions upon which require the relinquishment of, of constitutional rights. If the state may compel the surrender of one constitutional right as a condition of its favor, it may in like manner compel a surrender of all. It is inconceivable that guarantees embedded in the Constitution of the United States may thus be manipulated out of existence. Frost and Frost Trucking Company versus Railroad, Commission 271 U.S. 583, another Supreme Court decision from 1926. So, like, when the court says that you, have, that you didn't file your paperwork in time to declare that you want a jury trial, and you have a right to jury trial, then that would be imposition of a requirement to relinquish your constitutional rights, which would be unlawful. Quote, it is difficult to meet it by any argument beyond this statement. An unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties, it affords no protections. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as inoperative as though it had never been passed. Norton versus Shelby County, 118 U.S. 425, another uh, Supreme Court decision. Three, the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive, that would be governor, police, sheriffs, and judicial officers, that would be judges, district attorneys, attorneys, they're judicial officers, clerks of the court, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. What does that say? That if you, if you're, if, it doesn't matter what branch of government you're in, if you're in the legislative branch, you know, senator and representative, before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, if you're in the uh, legislature, if you're in the executive branch, or if you're in the judicial branch. There's only three branches of government. They all have to take an oath and be bound by it to support the Constitution. What is that? That makes them a trustee. Fraud in its elementary common law sense of deceit, and there is one of the meanings that fraud bears. And then it notes what case that's from, 43 U.S. 372, a Supreme Court case. In the statute, see United States v. Dial, includes the deliberate concealment of material information in the setting of a fiduciary obligation. Fiduciary means trustee of a trust. 
A public official is a fiduciary towards the public, including in the case of a judge, the litigants who appear before him, and if he, the judge, deliberately conceals material information from them, he is guilty of fraud. When a judge is busily soliciting loans from counsel to one party and not telling the opposing counsel, let alone the public, he is concealing material information in violation of his fiduciary obligations. And that's from McNally versus United States, 43 U.S. 350, Supreme Court decision. So they are required to give you a statement of economic interest and tell you all of their financial holdings so that you can investigate and determine whether their financial holdings would, would create a conflict of interest in your case. The Constitution is the trust uh, indenture, and the oath is the acceptance of trustee position to do, execute the indenture. So let's quickly go over the Bill of Rights, Amendment 1, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, speech, and the press, rights of the assembly and petition. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Who needs a permit? As long as you're peaceable, you have a right to assemble. What happens when the cops start shooting uh, <laughs> rubber bullets and stuff? You have a right to arrest them and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. Amendment number two. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The right of the people. Does it say the right of the citizens? Nope. You know, as a citizen subject of the United States under the 14th Amendment, you have no rights. The government grants you privileges. Civil rights are privileges. They're not rights. <clears throat> By definition, that was decided in the slaughterhouse cases. Anyway, so you have a, if you're one of the people, and if you're not a citizen of the United States, then you have the right to keep and bear arms, and that right can't be infringed upon. What's infringed? They can't make anything that um, detracts from your right to keep and bear arms. Like, you don't, you can't keep your gun loaded. And here, this is Jerry Brown, the new governor of California on October 11th, 2011. Jerry Brown signs ban of open carry of handguns. Governor Jerry Brown has outlawed the open carrying of unloaded handguns in California, signing a bill late Saturday night, Sunday night, that makes the practice that had been popular with some gun rights advocates a misdemeanor in the state. The bill, AB 144, by Assemblyman Anthony Pontentino, Democrat from La Canada, Flint Ridge, Los Angeles County, will take effect January 1st and was backed by law enforcement officials. So there is a complete violation of his oath of office. He is at war with the Constitution. He's obviously guilty of sedition. And if he has any foreign backing, treason. Amendment 4, search and arrest warrants. The right of the people to be secure in their persons' houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall, be viol shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. Well, oath or affirmation is I swear under penalty of perjury, right? And probable cause means probable cause. An apparent state of facts, get that, facts, found to exist upon reasonable inquiry that is, such inquiry as to the given, as the given case renders convenient and proper, which would induce a reasonably intelligent and prudent man to believe in a criminal case, that the accused person had committed the crime charged, or in a civil case that a cause of action existed. I saw a man smoking what looked like a marijuana cigarette. These are facts. Just going on a fishing expedition, get out of the car, I need to search it. There's no facts that are stated that would cause a reasonable man to believe that a crime had been committed. What crime had been committed? They have, they have to state that, or I saw you hit somebody over the head with a baseball bat. That's probable cause. Or somebody reported to me that you hit somebody over the head with a baseball bat. There has to be a witness to a crime. 
to give them probable cause. They okay, this is a case about probable cause. Supreme Court. Two police officers while cruising near noon in a patrol car observed appellant and another man walking away from one another in an alley in an area with a high incidence of drug traffic. They stopped and asked appellant to identify himself, hey, show me ID, and explained what he was doing. Why does he have to do any of that? One officer testified that he stopped appellant because the situation looked suspicious and we had never seen the subject in the area before. So what? The officers did not claim to suspect appellant of any specific misconduct, nor did they have any reason to believe he was armed. When appellant refused to identify himself, he was arrested for violation of a Texas, Texas statute which makes it a criminal act for a person to refuse to give his name and address to an officer who has lawfully stopped him and requested the information. Appellant's motion to set aside an information charging him with violation of the statute on the ground that the statute violated the first, fourth, fifth, and fourteenth amendments was denied and he was convicted and fined. By the way, he lost in the Superior Court, the local court, and then he lost at the Appellate Court in Texas, and he also lost at the Supreme Court in Texas before finally having to take it to the Supreme Court of the United States to have it reversed. So held the application of the Texas statute to detain appellant and require him to identify himself violated the Fourth Amendment because the officers lacked any reasonable suspicion to believe that the appellant was engaged or had engaged in criminal conduct. Detaining appellant to require him to identify himself constituted a seizure of his person subject to the requirement of the Fourth Amendment that the seizure be reasonable. The Fourth Amendment requires that such a seizure be based on specific objective facts and criteria and the officer's actions were not justified on the ground that they had a reasonable suspicion based on objective facts that he was involved in criminal activity absent any basis for suspecting appellant for misconduct, the balance between the public interest in crime prevention and appellant's right to personal security and privacy tilts in favor of freedom from police interference. Absent the basis for any suspecting appellant of misconduct. They didn't see him committing a crime. And if they didn't see him committing a crime, they have no right to accost him, demand to, to search his pockets, demand that he answer any questions. He's free to go about his business. Probable cause. This is a biggie. You have to learn what probable cause is, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. You want to, the police today, they want to come into your house, handcuff you, take you outside so you can't even witness what they're doing, and then ransack your house looking for evidence that there's a crime. Now you see how different it would be if they had to come to your door with a warrant signed by a judge stating that they believe you have marijuana in your home and the, you have marijuana for sale. And they believe it's being kept in your cupboards. Why? Because they got a snitch that says you got marijuana kept in your cupboard. At least they're identifying what they're looking for and where it is. So they have a right to look in your cupboard. Oh, there's no marijuana there. We got to leave. We can't just start turning the place upside down. Amendment 5. Rights, rights in criminal cases. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous, infamous crime. Capital would be death, right? Capital. Um, unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Of course, it's all, we always have a war going on. There's a war on drugs, a war on this, a war on that. There'll be a war on thinking pretty soon. Nor shall any person be subject to the same offense be, to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. This, this is a common law right from old England that you just, you know, you, they can't make you testify against yourself. So when the police say, hey, tell me what's in, the, what's in your pockets and tell me what's this and tell me what's that, tell me your name, you don't have to testify against yourself. If they have any evidence that a crime has been committed, 
then they don't need your testimony. And if they don't have any evidence, then they can wait until they get some. Nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Due process of law, law in its regular course of administration through courts of justice. That's from a court case, courts of justice. Due process of law, as used in the Constitution, cannot mean less than a prosecution or suit instituted and conducted according to the prescribed forms and solemnities for ascertaining guilt or determining the title to property. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So if they took your dog off the street, is that your private property? Sure, you paid for it, it's your dog. They took your dog, put him in the pound, told you unless you gave him $175, they're not gonna give him back to you. Did they take your uh, private property for public use without just compensation? You bet. Hey, my dog's worth $600, you gonna give me a check for $600? Oh, we'll give you the dog back. Okay. You have to have the right to defend yourself. If you don't have the right to defend yourself, then they just, they took your stuff without, without you having a right to defend yourself. Amendment 6, rights to a fair trial. In all, criminal, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. One problem is they don't define speedy. I mean, the Constitution should say that speedy is within two months or three months by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. Impartial jury? That would be one where the judge doesn't tell them what to do. Which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. I don't think there's a judge in town today that knows what the nature and cause of an accusation is. If you ask them, I've never heard one answer that. They don't, they'd tell you they don't, you don't have any right to know the nature and cause. Well, Jerry Kirk makes it clear. The nature of the case is whether it's criminal or civil. Is it a tort? Is it a crime? Is it a trespass? Or is it civil about money? And the cause of action is what form of law it's being prosecuted. Is it a civil case under equity, right? Is it a money case under equity or is it a tort case under common law? If you're involved in a trespass where there's physical violence involved, it, there's only two uh, forms of law it could be. It can be common law and it can be admiralty. If you're involved in a money dispute, it can be a maritime claim, which would be a shipping contract. It could be a maritime or it could be um, equity, okay, in the nature and cause of the accusation to be confronted with the witnesses against him. That's a, you have a right to face your accuser, right? If somebody's going to witness, you have a right to face him and, and uh, cross-examine him. To have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor. In other words, you got somebody who doesn't want to come to court because they're too busy, you have a right to subpoena them to come to court and to have assistance of counsel for his defense. Now you'll notice it says assistance of counsel. It doesn't say assistance of an attorney. And yet in 1787, they knew what the word attorney meant. They knew what the word barrister meant. They knew what a lawyer was, but they didn't say that. They said counsel. And then as far as a state being able to license the practice of law, a state cannot exclude a person from the practice of law or from any other occupation in a manner or for reasons that contravene the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Well, I would use the due process clause of the 4th, 5th, and 6th Amendments. Quote, whether the practice of law is a right or a privilege, whether the practice of law is a right or a privilege, need not here be determined. Yeah, we don't want to look into that question, whether it's a right to practice law or a privilege. It is not a matter of the state's grace. In other words, the state doesn't have the right to um, withhold the right to practice law. 
It's not a matter of the state's grace, and a person cannot be barred except for valid reasons. Once again, like most lawyers and attorneys and judges, they leave themselves an out because it should say a person cannot be barred. Schwer versus Board of Bar Examiners in New Mexico, 353 U.S. 232. It's another Supreme Court decision. We cannot say with assurance that under the allegations of the pro se com complaint, which we hold to less stringent standards than formal pleadings drafted by lawyers, it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of his claim which would entitle him to relief. Haynes versus Kerner, 404 U.S. 519, a Supreme Court decision. So what they're stating in there that's important is the pro se complaint, which is the private party's complaint without a lawyer, pro se, without an attorney, is held to less stringent standards. It's not going to be <laughs> judged according to the exact filling, crossing the I's and dotting the T's and filing the right forms. All you have to do is make the claim. The substance of your claim is more important than the form of the claim. And counsel, wise counsel is what your uh, reverend gives you. Wise counsel is what, you know, you, the village elder gives you. Counsel is counsel. You can ask your best friend to show up with you and guide you on what to say at court, and that's what your right. You have a right to these things. Rights aren't privileges. Rights can't be infringed upon. Rights are rights. Amendment 7, rights in civil cases. In suits at common law, so you can see you can have civil cases at common law because in common law you could still sue for debt, right, which is money, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20. The right of a trial by jury shall be preserved. So if it's less than 20 bucks, you don't get a right to a jury trial, which in those days, $20 was probably a lot of money. But be that as it may, this, attorney, this Amendment 7 has never been overturned, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. No fact tried by a jury. If you have a common law jury trial, guess what? The Supreme Court can't overrule your decision. The only thing that, the only way you could have that determination overruled is to have another common law trial with another jury that came to a different conclusion. But no court can overturn your determination. It can't be re-examined. The Supreme Court can't re-examine it. We don't have common law courts anymore and the jurors are not supreme. What you have is administrative courts not operating under the Constitution. Amendment 8, bails, fines, and punishments. Excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. No, Amendment 9, rights retained by the people, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So the people have unlimited rights. The Constitution is only there to keep the government in check. Amendment 10, powers retained by the states and the people. The powers not delegated to the United States by this Constitution, by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So once again, the powers not delegated to the United States by this Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states and the people. The federal government doesn't have any authority. Then we move on to Amendment 13, this is a biggie, abolition of slavery. The 13th Amendment was proposed on January 31, 1865 and ratified on December 6, 1865. This probably never actually happened, however. And the original 13th Amendment was an amendment that stated there's no titles of nobility. Section 1, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. In other words, we can send you to jail. That's involuntary servitude whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. 
Today, we are modern day slaves. The government doesn't come out and tell you this, but you live in a police state where they can take your property, your car, just because you don't get tags for it and drive on the streets that you own, the public right of way. Okay? That's the definition of slavery. When the policeman can tell you that he has more authority than you do, even though you haven't harmed anybody, he's going to arrest you because you're impeding his obligation to fulfill his duty and job. He asks you what your name is and you refuse to identify yourself. He can give you, find you in violation of Penal Code 148.1 and say that you are obstructing his investigation. Investigation into what? What crime has been committed? Well, you didn't identify yourself. That's a crime in today's world. So, obviously, slavery is here. The 14th Amendment, this is probably the biggest amendment in the Constitution. This is where the whole country was turned into slaves by, with, by everybody's consent. The 14th Amendment was proposed on June 13, 1866 and ratified on July 9, 1868. That is a flat-out lie, as 10 of the southern states had the army come in and remove the governors or force the legislature to adopt it. You can't adopt something, you can't adopt something unless it's voluntary, you see. If you're going to point a gun at somebody's head, then that's under threat and duress, and that's not a ratification. Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the states wherein they reside. Well, there's two words there, well, a couple of words, reside, persons, and jurisdiction, right? So let's read that backwards and state that if you state that you are a United States citizen, then you are agreeing that you were born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. But I'm claiming that I'm not a 14th Amendment citizen because I'm not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States I'm one of the people, and the Constitution of the United States makes the government subject to my jurisdiction. I'm not subject to their jurisdiction. So let's go back, let's go down, and we'll see the real deal here. Section 4 The validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, not by the people, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion. Gee, I wonder why they'd have that in there. Could it be because only four years earlier you had a civil war that cost tons of money? Shall not be questioned, but neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss of emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. <clears throat> First of all, you can't impair the obligation of contracts, can you? So the real issue here is that is that um, did the people of the United States enter into a contract where they would be liable for the nation's debts? Did they? I mean, can you be forced to be liable for a debt? Well, you can if you're a slave. But if you're not a slave and you're a free man, then you can't, I, I can't go to you and go, hey, you know, I spent a lot of money on your behalf and now you have to pay for it. First thing you're going to say is, I never agreed to pay for it. You decided to go to war. You didn't ask me if it was okay. You didn't ask me if I was going to pay for it. You decided to go to war. If you want to spend $50 billion on going to war in Iraq, knock yourself out. I don't condone that behavior. I'm not responsible for your behavior, and I don't consent to pay for the killing of innocent people over in Iraq. I don't consent to that. I'm not going to pay for it and I'm going to charge you with war crimes. There is a citizenship of the United States and a citizenship of the state, which are distinct from each other. Go slaughterhouse cases, 16 wall 36. And privileges and immunities, although fundamental, 
which do not arise out of the nature and character of the national government are not specifically protected by the federal constitution, are attributes of the state and not of the national citizenship. Twining versus State, 211 U.S. 78 in 1908. That's another Supreme Court decision. By metaphysical refinement in exam examining our form of government, it may be correctly said that there is no such thing as a citizen of the United States. You'll notice that this is ex parte Knowles, 5 California 300 and 302 in 1855, and that's before the uh, 1868 14th Amendment was signed. There is in our political system a government of each of the several states and a government of the United States. Each is distinct from the other and has citizens of its own who owe it allegiance and whose rights within the jur its jurisdiction must, it must protect. The same person may be at the same time a citizen of the United States and a citizen of a state, but his rights of citizenship under one of those governments will be different from those he has under the other. Now, that's in 1875, after the 14th Amendment. That's a U.S. Uh, Supreme Court decision also. Now, why would that be? Why wouldn't your rights be the same? They're telling you that there's a difference. Now, let's take a look at some of the California Constitution and its interesting aspects. Okay, this is from the legislature in California, by the way. And we notice in it the first thing is the Magna Carta 1215. This is law. Mayflower Compact, 1620, Declaration of Rights, 1765 and 1774, Declaration of Independence, 1776, Articles of Confederation, 1778. So we have the Magna Carta, which is listed out in its entirety. Okay, let's see. No free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled in any way or in any way harmed, nor will we go upon or send upon him, save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Okay, so there you go. You can't be set in jail unless your peers uh, accept it, lawful judgment of your peers. Of course, they always have a back door or by the law of the land, convenient for them. We have the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is also law. And here we have, you know, the law which was administered. And this in spite of the fact it was clear that there was no authorization for applying the common law until it had been adopted by the legislature. Footnote 10, April 13th, 1850, right? And then we have uh, important problems for the convention. The Bill of Rights is submitted by the committee made no reference to the question of slavery, but on motion, Mr. Shannon, a, sec a section prohibiting slavery was adopted without opposition. This was the 1849 Constitution. Violent opposition was shown to corporations and particularly to banking co corporations. Reference was frequently made to the Panic of 1837, right? which, Panic of 1837, which was still fresh in the minds of many members. It was finally provided that corporations may be formed under general laws, but shall not be created by special act, and that no corporate body sh shall be created renewed or extended with the privileges of making, issuing, or putting in circulation any bill, check, ticket, certificate, promissory note, or other paper or paper of uh, any bank to circulate as money. So here we have, you know, here's the, Consti you know, the Constitution in 1849 discussing the fact that corporations are evil and that corporations that print paper money are banned for life. The first article was a Declaration of Rights, which provided that all men were free and independent. What? No slaves? And that political power was inherent in the people. Political power was inherent in the people. Guaranteed trial by jury 
and freedom of religion, that the writ of habeas corpus should not be suspended, and more. So suffrage, right? Article two, suffrage. The right of suffrage was that's the right to vote was guaranteed was granted to every white male citizen of the United States. Hey, there's no slaves here. Oh, the females? Yeah, they're slaves, of course. They don't get to vote. What a bunch of guys. Section 13 of the California Constitution. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures may not be in violated and a warrant may not issue except on probable cause. So in California, you still have the same rules as the federal uh, constitution. And trial by jury, right? Section 16. This is Article 1, Section 16. Trial by jury is an inviolate right and shall be secured to all. But in a civil cause, three quarters of the jury may render a verdict. A jury may be waived in a criminal cause by the consent of both parties expressed in open court by the defendant and the defendant's counsel. In a civil cause, a jury may be waived by the consent of the parties expressed as prescribed by statute. So you have to waive your right to a jury trial, even in a civil case. Section 25, the people shall have the right to fish upon and from the public lands of the state and in the waters thereof, excepting upon land set aside for fish hatcheries. A right to fish. Who needs a fishing license? You have a right to fish under the Constitution. But I guess if you don't know that, they're not going to let you know. They're going to tell you the law says you have to have a license to fish. You have to arrest that fish and game guy for trespassing on you. Okay. Any person who is resident and doing business in the state of California has, will have standing to sue the state of California and enforce this section, and the courts of record of the state of California shall have jurisdiction to hear cases brought to enforce this section. Article 6, the judicial. Section 1, the judicial power of the state is vested in the Supreme Court, courts of appeal, and superior courts, all of which are courts of record. Got that? All of which are courts of record. Section 16, Article 6, Section 16. That B, the judge, judges of superior courts shall be elected in their counties at general elections except as otherwise necessary to meet the requirements of federal law. Okay? Elected, have to be elected. Shall be elected. And then under 2, the governor shall fill vacancies in those courts by appointment. An appointee holds office until Monday after January 1st following the first general election at which the appointee has the right to become a candidate. They have to go straight from uh, appointee to candidate. And here we go. Temporary judges. Section 21. On stipulation of the parties, litigant, the court may order a cause to be tried by a temporary judge who is a member of the state bar sworn and empowered to act until final determination of the cause. On stipulation, that means you have to agree to it. You have to stipulate. You have to say, expressly admit that you are okay with having your case heard by a temporary judge. What's a temporary judge? In my mind, if the governor appoints somebody, that's a temporary judge. The only person who's not a temporary judge is one who's been elected. And here's the biggie, Article 20, Section 3, Oath of Office. Now you'll notice in here there's three paragraphs. Excuse me, Paragraph 1, Paragraph 2, and Paragraph 3 is down here. I, so John Doe, do sw solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. The, the next paragraph is missing. And I do further swear or affirm that I do not advocate, nor I am a member of any party or organization, political or otherwise, that now advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States or the state of California by force or violence or any other unlawful means. And yet, in reality, they work with Interpol, they work with the United Nations, they work with foreign agents and governments, the World Bank, and their whole purpose is the overthrow of the Constitution and the de jure government of the state of California. And they want to replace it with 
a corporate entity that is subservient to the World Bank. I have not been a member of a party of, of, or organization, political or otherwise, that advocated the overthrow of the government of the United States or the state of California by force or violence or any other law, unlawful means, except as follows. And then in parentheses it says, if no affiliations write in the words, no exceptions. And that during such time I hold the office of, name the office, I will not advocate nor become a member of any party or organization, political or otherwise, like the Bar Association, right? Which is based in England, a foreign corporation that attorneys take an oath to, that advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States or the state of California by force or violent or other unlawful means. So, and it says, and no other oath or declaration or test shall be required as a qualification for any public office or employment. So, if it's got three paragraphs, that's the oath. That's the, no other oath other than the three paragraph one is the one that's required. Public office, officer and employee includes every office or an employee of the state, including the University of California, every county, city, city and county, district and, and authority, including any department, division, bureau, board. You work for the government, you got to take this oath of office. So, uh, to understand our rights, first of all, where does law come from and who are we? Who are we? Man, right? Man and women. So, we are created by God, right? God's the creator. God created everything natural the earth, bugs, worms, everything natural. Is a corporation a natural creation? No. Legal fictions were created by law. But everything that's natural in the world is a creation of God, of which man is one. So man's a creation of God, so he, be, he, you know, he has the right to self-determination. I mean, if you're alone on a desert island, you do as you will. You do as you choose. You can do anything you want. If you don't gather berries and fish, you're going to die. But the, but the fact is, is it's still your choice to do with, what you, with your time as you see fit. If it's not self-determination, the only other form of, of governance is military dictatorship. Think about it. If somebody has a gun to your head, if the warlord tells you what you can and can't do, it's because there's a gun to your head. It's a military dictatorship. You either have a military dictatorship, somebody's got a gun, and enforcing his will on you, or you have a right to self-determination. So as Edwin Vieira would say, you know, we started off coming from England as a group to escape religious persecution, to have freedom of choice. So we come to America, and the form of government we have in the United States of America is a form of government created by a Declaration of Independence and a Constitution. And since the king was, the king's rule was rejected by the population, they took up arms against the king and sent the king packing. And so because the, because the monarchy, which had subjects, no longer existed, there was nobody over the population, right? There's no one superior. There's no title of nobility, which shows that some one man is superior to another. And we have what we have in the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. So if we're all equal, if I can tell you what to do, then you can tell me what to do, and it kind of negates it. So neither of us tell each other what to do, and as long as we keep off each other's toes, everything's hunky-dory. It only becomes an issue when one man tries to enforce his will on another. So the men, you know, man created the U.S. Constitution, which is a corporate trust, and it's a, it's the language of it is a trust. So, and then the trust, the corporate trust, the U.S. Constitution, the written indenture here, f became the um, impetus for a government, federal government anyway. And then the federal government decided that it was without enough power, so it wanted to create subjects of its own, thinking it had the rights of a king. What are the rights of a king? Sovereignty. Sovereignty means you have no higher power and the sovereign decrees the law. 
So the um, 14th Amendment citizens were created with the 14th Amendment, and they were subject to the jurisdiction of the federal government of the United States. Now there's a difference between the United States of America and the United States. The United States of America was created under the Constitution. The United States was created in 1871 as a separate uh, corporate trust. Anyway, 14th Amendment citizens are subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. And one of the thing about the 14th Amendment is that you can't challenge any federal debt. Right? You can't challenge a debt. Now, over here we have the people are common law freemen. They don't have a king and they're self-governing. This guy gets in trouble because the education today teaches everybody to be this guy. And this is the hardest thing for most people to overcome is that you are taught from birth to grave that you never question authority. Never ever question authority. If you do question authority, you're going to uh, get beat on, basically. I mean, you're going to be arrested, thrown in jail, stripped naked, whatever. They can do whatever they want to you with impunity. So anyway, the, the, the uh, 14th Amendment citizen is not taught that he has any rights, that there's a constitution, can't recite the constitution. If you ask the man on the street to recite the constitution, and, and how about just the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the constitution that supposedly limit the powers of government, you'll find that very few could state a single one of them in its entirety, and they might have a few pat answers like, you know, you have freedom of speech, you have uh, the right to bear arms, but they don't really believe that. In fact, the first 10 amendments are all privileges if you are a 14th Amendment citizen. They're not rights, they're privileges. Civil rights, civil rights are privileges. The common law free man, on the other hand, can enforce all of those constitutional rights because he is not a 14th Amendment citizen. He has to revoke that 14th Amendment citizen status in order to have the Ten Amendments apply to him. The first and easiest way to enforce the Constitution is through the oath of office. In the Constitution, everyone is required to take an oath of office. It's a requirement. So the first thing you would want to do would be to challenge the party who's trying to enforce his will on you I need to see your oath of office. Do you ever challenge them? Do you ever state, before I'm going to take your assessment that I owe you taxes, I'm going to need a few things from you. I'm going to need to see your oath of office. So if you go down to your local county clerk, not the county recorder, although some places they might be the same, where they do birth certificates and death certificates, they will have the oath of office on file. Down. If they tell you that there's none on file, you bring a voice recorder and somebody else to be a witness that can sign an affidavit, and you record the fact that they don't have it. Demand, notice and demand, in writing, signed, that I need so-and-so, chief of police, the officer who arrested you, whatever, I need so-and-so's oath of office. You have to get certified copies. The oath of office is an offer to contract. If you accept their offer in writing on a certified copy and you just write across it, I accept your oath of office as a binding bilateral contract and you sign your name to it, now you have a contract between yourself and the party who made the oath. Did you sign the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of California or the Constitution of your state? No, you didn't sign it. So you have no right to enforce that contract. The only way you have a right to enforce that contract is if you become a party to it through signing an acceptance of the oath of office. You know, as Jesus did in the Bible, you answer a question with a question. You know, I need to see your license and registration. Well, I'm going to need to see your oath of office and bond before I can accept you as being a peace officer. 
but you have to deny that they have any authority over you. And the only way you can do that is verbally, and the only way you can prove it is by recording it. Video camera, audio recording, have that going on all the time. Always carry those things with you wherever you go because if you get into a confrontation, you need to be able to turn those devices on and record the conversation.